planetary health. There is no doubt that our global environment is changing. From the hotter season we call to the world's right disappearance of foreigners, to the global collapse of fisheries, and to our use of about half of the planet in livable surface to feed ourselves. We are now in a new geological era, the Anthropocene, characterized by humanity's dramatic impact on health natural systems. And through the average global citizen health has improved over the past century. The health of our planet has sharply declined, putting historically recent and fragile public health against at risk. We are faced not only with climate change, but also with declining biodiversity, short ages, and arable land and fresh water, pollution and changing biochemicals flow. We are dramatically affecting our global food production system. The quality of the air we breathe and the water we drink, our exposure to infectious diseases, and even the habitability of the places where we live. Changes to natural life support system are already impacting our health and are projecting to drive the majority of global burden of disease over the coming century. Hitting today's most vulnerable and future generation the hardest. Everything is connected. What we do to the world comes back to affect us. It's not always in ways that we would expect. Understanding and acting upon these challenges calls for massive collaboration across disciplinary and national boundaries to safeguard our health. The last 15 years have seen unprecedented improvements in human health as measured by most conventional metrics. This human flourishing has, however, been at the cost of extensive degradations to the health, ecological, and biogeochemical system. The impacts of transformation to these systems, including accelerating climate disruptions, land degradation, growing water scarcity, fishery degradations, pollutions, and biodiversity loss, have already begun to negatively impact human health. Left unchecked, these challenges threaten to reverse the global health gains of the past several decades and will likely become the dominant threats to health over the next century. But there is also much cause for hope. How our environment is changing, water scarcity. Water is at the core of sustainable development and it is critical for some economic development healthy ecosystems and for human survival itself. It is vital for reducing the global burden of diseases and improving the health, welfare and productivity of population. Water is also at the heart of adaptation to climate change, serving as a crucial link between the climate system, human society and the environment. Without proper water governance, there is likely to be increased competition for water between sectors and an escalation of water crises of various kinds, triggering emergencies in a range of water-dependent sectors. The physical world of water is closely bound up with the social political world, with water often a key factor in managing risks such as famine, epidemics, inequalities and political instability. Water scarcity can mean a scarcity in availability due to physical shortage or a scarcity in access due to the failure of institution to ensure a regular supply or due to a lack of adequate infrastructure. Water scarcity already affects every continent Water use has been growing globally at more than twice the rate of population increase in the last century, and an increased number of regions are reaching the limit at which water services can be sustainable delivered, especially in arid regions. Challenges Water scarcity will be exacerbated as rapidly growing urban areas place heavy pressure on neighboring water resources. Climate change and bioenergy demands are also expect, expected to amplify the already complex relationship between world development and 
water demand. Opportunities. There is not a global water shortage as such, but individual countries and regions need to urgently tackle the critical problems represented by water stress. Water has to be treated as a scarce resource with a fewer stronger focus on managing demand. Integrated water resources management provides a broad framework for governments to align water use patterns with the needs and demands of different users, including the environment. Facts. Number one, over 2 billion people live in countries experiencing high water stress. Number two, it is estimated that by 2040, one in four of the world's children under age 18, some 600 million in all will be living in areas of extremely high water stress. Number three, 700 million people worldwide could be displaced by intense water scarcity by 2030. Number four, about 4 billion people, representing nearly two-thirds of the world population, experience severe water scarcity during at least one month of the year. Number five, with the existing climate change scenario, by 2030, water scarcity in some areas and semi-arid places will displace between 24 million and 700 million people. Number six, a third of the world's biggest round water systems are already in distress. Number seven, nearly half the global population are already living in potential water scarce areas at least one month per year. And this could increase to some 4.8, 5.7 billion in 2050. About 73% of the affected people live in Asia. Changing food systems. Food systems are changing with growing resilience in many regions on global supply chains and large scale distribution systems that are both meeting and fueling changes in food demand and dietary preferences while improving efficiency. The changing nature of food systems also creates new challenges and concerns regarding the high calorie and low nutritional value of food of many food items. Access of small scale producers to viable markets highlight levels of food loss and waste. Incidents of food safety, animal and human health risk, and increased energy intensity and ecological footprints associated with the lengthening of food supply chains. In order to properly understand the implication of these challenges for future food security and nutrition, they will need to be looked at from the perspective of food systems at large and will require the coordinated actions of a multitude of actions. Global environment change, particularly climate change, pollinator declines, fishery and wildlife declines, water shortage, and other forms of environmental processes will perversively affect our food systems and the ability to provide a growing human population with enough quality nutrition. Research is needed to understand how multiple interacting types of environmental change impact the quantity and quality of food available to different populations around the world. Another important priority is to understand how accelerating changes and losses to many wild and indigenous foods are likely to alter nutrition intake for different populations and affect their health. Essentially, current food systems are failing us in terms of livelihoods, human health, and the environment. We have to look beyond the idea that more food in the world and greater productivity will solve our problems. Local and national food systems need to be strengthened to adapt to climate crisis and become better equipped to provide diverse diets to consumers in food insecure communities. 
Diversity in diets can help farmers di diversify the risk, provide markets for food crops, break their dependency on commodity crops, and increase biodiversity and resilience. While hundreds of millions are undernourished, 672 million people suffer from obesity and a further 1.3 billion are overweight. How can we change this? Obesity is an incredibly complex issue. However, there is a clear linkage between current food systems. The food we are producing, its price and obesity, and other non-communicable disease like type 2 diabetes. What is not helping is that our food systems are dominated by fewer and fewer crops that drive negative food systems outcomes, changing taste from a growing global middle class, as well as commoditization of our food systems, often shaped by agricultural subsidies have meant that people are eating less diverse than before. This has resulted in excessive tillage of arable land, which is degrading soils, releasing carbons and looking farmers into unprofitable production systems. What about agricultural subsidies? Are they helping or hindering us? While science point us in one direction, very often prevailing food and agriculture policies lead us in a different one. The world spends about $1 million per minute on agricultural subsidies that often drive in biodiversity loss and climate change. We see that around two thirds of these subsidies are negatively influencing long-term livelihoods, the environment and our health, we can reprogram them to regenerate agriculture and restoration leading to long-term food security and nutrition. There is amazing new technology which help us large funds to help small farmers through blockchain, for example. So we have the architecture now to enable even smallholder farmers to access capital but all kinds of investments are still needed the unique power of the united nation is to convene give a very clear policy guidance encourage market signals and the shifting of fiscal policy developing countries have completely different food systems to develop countries what does this tell us about global food systems? Well, would you be surprised while generally developing and developed countries do still have different food systems? The westernization of diets towards more proceed and less diverse food is impacting developing countries too. Having said that, yes, these food systems are different. One tends to be highly organized and dominated by large producers, manufacturers, and retailers, and the others tend to have mainly smallholders and short supply chains, with more diverse food available in formal markets. However, we have found that analysis of these two food systems can indicate different priorities fraction. In each country, for example, the priority food systems action in developing country might be lacking post-harvest loses and pesticide use. What areas in developed countries, it might be land degradation caused by continuous monocropping and food waste. Finally, some questions to be asked. Number one, what is needed to promote change in the food systems to achieve more nutrition sensitive policies and programs. Number two, how to make agriculture policies and programs more nutrition sensitive. Number three, what is the potential economic impact of nutrition sensitive food systems? Number four, what are the ongoing country initiatives to make agriculture nutrition sensitive and how it is done? Number five, what are the challenges faced? What are the key lessons learned and achievements so far? Number six, 
what are the gaps that need to be addressed to promote more nutrition sensitive food systems number seven what is needed at country level to move this great agenda forward number seven what kind of institutional arrangements and policies the environments and supportive of nutrition sensitive food systems what are their key features number eight how to monitor and evaluate nutrition sensitive interventions with food systems approach urbanization human beings have become an increasingly powerful environmental force over the last 10,000 years with the evidence of agriculture 8,000 years ago we began to change the plan and with the industrial revolution we began to affect our atmosphere the recent increase in the world's population has magnified the effect of our agriculture and economic activities but the growth in the world population has marked what may be an even more important human environmental interaction while the world's population is doubling the world's urban population is tripling within the next few years more than half the world's population will be living in urban areas the level and growth of urbanization differ considerably by region among developing countries latin american countries have the highest proportion of their population living in urban areas but east and south asia are likely to have the fattest growth rates in the next 30 years almost all future world population growth will be in towns and cities both the increase and the distribution of the earth's population are likely to affect the natural systems of the earth and the interactions between the urban environments and populations. In 1800, only about 2% of the world's population lived in urban areas. That was a small wonder. Until a century ago, urban areas were some of the unhealthiest places for people to live. The increased density of populations in urban areas led to the rapid spread of infectious diseases. Consequently, Death rates in urban areas historically were higher than in rural areas. The only way urban areas maintained their existence until recently was by the continual immigration of rural people. In only 200 years, the world's urban population has grown from 2% to nearly 50% of all people. The most striking examples of the urbanization of the world are the mega cities of 10 million or more people. In 1975, only four mega cities existed. In 2000, there were 18. And by 2015, the UN estimates that there will be 22. Much of the future growth, however, will not be in these huge agglomerations but in the small to medium-sized cities around the world. The growth in urban areas come from both the increasing migration to the cities and the fertility of urban populations. Much of urban migration is driven by rural populations' desire. For the advantage that urban areas offer, urban advantage include greater opportunities to receive education, healthcare, and services such as entertainment. The urban poor have less opportunity for education than urban non-poor, but still they have more chance than rural populations. Urban fertility rates through lower than rural fertility rates in every region of the world contribute to the growth within urban areas. Women who migrated from rural areas have more children than those born in urban areas. Of course, the rural migrants to urban areas are not a random selection of the rural population. They're more likely to have wanted fewer children even if they had stayed in the countryside. 
So the difference between the fertility of urban migrants and rural women probably exaggerates the impacts of urban migration on fertility. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the urban fertility rates about 1.5 children less than in rural areas. In Latin America, the differences are almost two children. Therefore, the urbanization of the world is likely to slow population growth. It is also likely to concentrate some environmental effects ge geographically. Urban populations interact with their environment. Urban people change their environment through their consumption of food, energy, water, and land. And in turn, the polluted urban environment affects the health and quality of life of the urban population. People who live in urban areas have very different consumption patterns than residents in rural areas. For example, urban populations consume much more food, energy, and durable goods than rural populations. In China, during the 1970s, the urban population consumed more than twice as much pork as the rural populations who were raising the pigs. With economic development, the difference in consumption declined as the rural populations are better diets. But even a decade later, urban population had 60% more pork in their diets than rural populations. The increasing consumption of meat is a sign of growing influence in Beijing. In India, where many urban residents are vegetarians, greater prosperity is seen in higher consumption of milk. Urban populations not only consume more food, but they also consume more durable goods. In the only 1990s, Chinese households in urban areas were two times more likely to have a TV, eight times more likely to have a washing machine, and 25 times more likely to have a refrigerator than rural households. This increased consumption is a function of urban labor markets, wages, and household structure. Energy consumption for electricity, transportation, cooking, and heating is much higher in urban areas than in rural villages. For example, urban populations have many more cars than rural populations per capita. Almost all the cars in the world in the 19 were in the United States. Today, we have a car for every two people in the United States. If that become the norm, in 2050, there would be 5.3 billion cars in the world, all using energy. In China, the per capita consumption of cooling towns and cities is over three times the consumption in rural areas. Comparisons of changes in the world energy consumption per capita and GNP show that the two are possibly correlated, but many not change at the same rate. As countries morph from using non-commercial forms of energy to commercial forms, the relative price of energy increases. Economies therefore often become more efficient as they develop because of advances in technologies and changes in consumption behavior. The urbanization of the world's populations, however, will increase aggregate energy use despite efficiencies in new technologies and the increased consumption of energy is likely to have deleterious environmental effects. Urban consumption of energy helps create heat lands that can change local weather patterns and weather. Downwind from the heat islands, the heat island phenomenon is created because cities radiate heat back into the atmosphere at a rate 15% to 30% less than rural areas. The combination of the created energy consumption and difference in alvero radiation means that cities are warmer than rural cities, 0.8 to 1.3 Celsius and these heat islands become traps for atmospheric pollutants. Cloudness and fog occur with greater frequency. 
precipitation is 5% to 10% higher in cities. Thunderstorms and hailstorms are much more frequent, but snow days in cities are less common. Urbanization also affects the broader regional environments. Regions downwind from large industrial complexes also see increases in the amount of precipitation. Air pollution and the number of days with thunderstorms. Urban areas affect not only the weather patterns, but also the runoff patterns for water. Urban areas generally generate more rain, but they reduce the infiltration of water and lower the water tables. This means that runoff occurs more rapidly with greater peak flows. Flood volumes increase as do floods and water pollution downstream. Many of the effects of urban areas on the environment are not necessarily linear. Bigger urban areas do not always create more environmental problems, and small urban areas can cause large problems. Much of what determines the extent of the environmental impacts is how the urban population behaves the consumption and living patterns, not just how large they are. The urban environment is an important factor in determining the quality of life in urban areas and the impact of urban area on the broader environment. Some urban environment problems induce inadequate water and sanitation, a lack of rubbish disposal, and industrial pollution. Unfortunately, reducing the problems and ameliorating their effects on the urban population are expensive. The health implications of these environmental problems include respiratory infections and other infections and parasitic diseases. Capital costs for building improved environmental infrastructure, for example, investment in cleaner public transportation systems such as subway and for building more hospitals and clinics are higher in cities where wages exceed those paid in rural areas and urban land prices are much higher because of the competition for space. But not all urban areas have the same kinds of environmental conditions or health problems. Some research suggests that indicators of health problems such as rates of infant mortality are higher in cities that are growing rapidly than in those where growth is lower. Urbanization is a global multidimensional process which manifests itself through rapidly changing human population densities and changing land cover. Urbanization is viewed today as endangering more species and as more geographically ubiquitous than any other human activity and also the major driving force for increased homogeneation of fauna and flora. The concept of ecosystem services has proven useful in describing human benefits from urban ecosystems. For example, urban vegetation may significantly reduce air pollution, mitigate the urban heat island effect, reduce noise, and enhance recreational and cultural values of importance for urban cities' well-being. New opportunities lie in that urban landscapes and are the very places where knowledge, innovation, and human and financial resources for getting solutions to global environmental problems are likely to be found. Urbanization is one of today's major public health challenges. Over 50% of the world's population now live in urban areas, the majority in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Annually, there will be 60 million new urban cities in towns and cities of the poorest countries. Urban peoples face a double burden of ill health, infectious disease, a link to poor waste and sanitation, exists alongside risk of industrial air and water pollution. In some cities, 
social value is, is epidemic, urban health policy needs to deal with both the old problems of industrialization and new problems of sustainability. Tackling urban inequality is a major priority in many cities. Biodiversity shift, biological diversity, which is being lost at, at a rate unprecedented in human history, underpins many natural systems on which humans depend for health and well-being. Depletion of natural resources, pollution, invasive species, climate change, ocean acidification, and habitat degradation are just some of the factors driving biodiversity loss on a global scale. Changes in biodiversity affect ecosystem structure and function, often causing threats to key ecosystem services. Biodiversity also impacts exposure to vector-borne disease in ways that are inadequately understood. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the variability among living organisms from all sources, including terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems and the ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes biodiversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. Biodiversity forms the foundation of the vast array of ecosystem services that critically contribute to human well-being. Biodiversity is important in human managed as well as natural ecosystems. Decisions humans make that influence biodiversity affect the well-being of themselves and others. Biodiversity is the foundation of ecosystem services to which human well-being is intimately linked. No feature of Earth is more complex, dynamic, and variety layer of living organisms that occupy its surface and its seas. And no feature is experiencing more dramatic change at the hands of humans than this extraordinary, singularly unique feature of Earth. This layer of living organism, the biosphere, through the metabolic activities of its innumerable plants, animals, and microbes, physically and chemically unites the atmosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere into one environmental system within which millions of species, including humans, have thrived, breathable air, potable water, fertile soils, productive lands, bountiful seas, and the equable climate of Earth's recent history. And other ecosystem services are, are manifestation of the workings of life. It follows that large-scale human influences over this biota have tremendous impacts on human well-being. It also follows that the nature of three impacts, good or bad, is within the power of humans to influence. Biodiversity is defined as a ver variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems and the ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes diversity between species and, and of ecosystems. The importance of this definition is that it draws attention to many dimensions of biodiversity. It's explicitly recognized that every biota can be characterized by its taxonomic, ecological, and genetic diversity, and that the way these dimensions of diversity vary over space and time is a key feature of biodiversity. Thus, only a multidimensional assessment of biodiversity can provide insights into the relationship between changes in biodiversity and changes in ecosystem functioning 
and ecosystem services. Biodiversity includes all ecosystem managed or unmanaged. Sometimes biodiversity is consumed to be a relevant feature of only unmanaged ecosystems, such as wildlands, nature preserves, or natural park. This is incorrect. Managed systems, be the plantations, farms, croplands, aquaculture sites, rangelands, or even urban parks and urban ecosystems have their own biodiversity. Given the cultivate systems alone now account for more than 24% of Earth's terrestrial surface, it is critical that any decision concerning biodiversity or ecosystem services address the maintenance of biodiversity in these larger anthropogenic systems. Biodiversity provides many goods and services essential to life on Earth. The management of natural resources can determine the baseline health status of a community. Environmental stewardship can contribute to secure livelihoods and improve the resilience of communities. The loss of these resources can create the conditions responsible for morbidity or mortality. Biodiversity supports human and social needs, including food and nutrition security, energy development of medicines and pharmaceuticals in fresh water, which together underpin good health. It also supports economic opportunities and leisure activities that contribute to overall well-being. Land use change, pollution, poor water quality, chemical and waste contamination, climate change and other causes of ecosystem degradation all contribute to biodiversity loss and can pose considerably threats to human health. Human health and well-being are influenced by the health of local plant and animal communities and the integrity of the local ecosystem that they form. Infectious diseases cause over 1 billion human infections per year, with millions of deaths each year globally. Approximately two-thirds of non-human infectious diseases are shared with animals, and the majority of recently emerging diseases are associated with wildlife. Natural disasters, humanitarian emergencies, including natural and human-made disasters, conflicts, and complex emergencies, constitute what has traditionally been considered the main threat to human health security worldwide. Each year, millions of people are affected by natural and man-made disasters around the world. Tornadoes, hurricanes, heavy rains, and earthquakes resulted in tens of thousands of deaths and many more affected, indeed, disastrous, if it were not for their effect on the human population. Links between the natural environment and human health have been suggested for centuries. Disasters throughout history have had significant impact on the numbers, health status, and lifestyle populations. It induced death, severe injuries, requiring extensive treatment, increased risk of communicable diseases, damage to the health facilities, damage to the water systems, food shortage, population movement. Social reaction. After a major natural disaster, behavior only rarely reaches generalized panic or stone waiting. A spontaneous yet highlight organized individual action occurs as survivors rapidly recover from their initial shock and set about purposefully to achieve clear personal ends. Earthquake survivors often begin search and rescue activities minutes after an impact and within hours may have 
organized himself into groups to transport the injured to medical posts. Actively, antisocial behaviors such as widespread looting occurs only in exceptional circumstances. Although everyone thinks his or her spontaneous reactions are entirely rational, they may be detrimental to the community's higher interest. A person's conflicting roles as family head and health official. For intense, having some instances resulted in key relief personnel not reporting to duty until their relative and property are safe. Rumors about particular of epidemics as a result considerably pressure may be put on the authorities to undertake emergency humanitarian work, such as mass vaccinations against typhoid or cholera, without some medical justification. In addition, people may be reluctant to submit to measures that the authorities think necessarily. During warming periods or other occurrence of natural disaster, people are reluctant to evacuate even if their homes are likely to be or have been destroyed. These patterns of behavior have two major implications for these making decisions about humanitarian programs. First, patterns of behavior and demands for emergency assistance can be limited and modified by keeping the population informed and by obtaining necessary information before embarking on extended relief programs. Second, the population itself will provide most rescue and first aid, take the injured to hospital if they are accessible, build temporary shelters and carry out other essential tasks. Additional resources should, therefore, be directed toward meeting the needs that survivors themselves cannot meet on their own. Communicable diseases. Natural disasters do not usually result in massive outbreaks of infectious diseases. Although in certain circumstances, they do increase the potential for disease transmission. In the short term, the most frequently observed increases in disease incidents are caused by facial contamination of water and food. Hence, such diseases are mainly interrelated. The rate of epidemic outbreaks of communicable diseases is proportional to population density and displacement. These conditions increase the pressure on water and food supplies at the risk of contaminations as in refugee camps. The disruptions of pre-existing sanitation services such as tap water and storage, and the fear to maintain or restore normal public health program in the immediate post-disaster period. In the longer term, an increase in vector-borne diseases occurs in some areas because of disruptions of vector control issues, particularly following heavy rains and floods, residual insecticides may be washed away from buildings and the number of mosquito breeding sites may increase. Moreover, displacement of wild and domesticated animals near human settlement brings additional risk and zoonotic infections. In complex disasters where malnutrition, overcrowding, and lack of the most basic sanitations are common. Catastrophic outbreaks of gastroenteritis caused by cholera and other diseases have occurred as in Rwanda in 1994. Population displacement. When large, spontaneous or organized population movements occur, an urgent need to provide humanitarian assistance is created. People may move to urban areas where public services cannot cope, and the result may be an increase in mortality 
in mortality. If much of the housing has been destroyed, large population movements may occur within urban areas as people seek shelter with relatives and friends. Service of settlements in towns around Managua, Nicaragua, following the December 1972 earthquake indicated that 80% to 90% of the 200,000 displaced persons were living with relatives and friends. 5% to 10% were living in parks, cities, squares, and vacant lots. And the reminders were living in schools and other public buildings following the earthquake that struck Mexico City in se September 1985. 72% of the 33,000 homeless found shelter in areas close to their destroyed dwellings. In internal conflicts, such as occurred in Central America, 1980s or Colombia, 1990s, refugees and internally displaced populations are likely to persist. Climate exposure. The health hazard of exposure to the elements are not great, even after disaster in temperate climates. As long as the population is dry, reasonably well closed and able to find windbreaks. Death from exposure does not appear to be a major risk in Latin America. The Caribbean, the need to provide emergency shelter therefore varies greatly with local conditions. Food and nutrition, food shortage in the immediate aftermath may arise in two ways. Food stock destruction within the disaster area may reduce the absolute amount of food available. A disruption of distribution systems may curtail access to food, even if there is no absolute shortage. Generalized food shortage severe enough to cause nutritional problems do not occur after earthquakes. Flooding and sea surges often damage households food stocks and crops, disrupt distribution, and cause major local shortage. Food distribution, at least in the short term, is often a major and urgent need, but large-scale importation, donation of food is not only usually necessary. In extended droughts, such as those occurring in Africa or in complex disasters, the homeless and refugees may be completely dependent on outside sources for food supplies for a variety of periods of time. Depending on the nutritional condition of these populations, especially of more vulnerable groups such as pregnant or lacking women, children, and the elderly, it may be necessary to institute emergency feeding programs Water supply and sanitation, drinking water supply, and sewage systems are particularly vulnerable to natural hazards, and the disruptions that occur in them pose a serious health risk. The systems are extensive, often in disrepair, and are exposed to a variety of hazards, deficiencies in established amounts and quality of potable water and difficulties in the disposal of ex excrete and other waste result in deterioration of sanitation, contributing to conditions portable to the spread of entering and other diseases. Mental health, anxiety, neurosis, and depressions are not measured. Acute public health problems immediately following disasters and family and neighbors in rural or traditional societies can deal with them temporarily. A group at high risk, however, seems to be the humanitarian volunteers or workers themselves. Wherever possible, efforts should be made to preserve family and, and community social structures. The indiscriminate use of sedatives and tranquilizer 
during the emergency relief force is strongly discouraged and industrialized or metropolitan areas in developing countries. Mental health problems are reported to be significant during long-term rehabilitations and reconstructions and need to be dealt with during the falls. Damage to the health infrastructure. Natural disaster can cause serious damage to health facilities and water supplies and storage systems. Having a direct impact on the health of the population dependent on the health services. In the case of structurally unsafe hospitals, and health centers. Natural disaster jeopardize the lives of occupants of the buildings and limit to capacity to provide health services to disaster victims. The earthquakes that struck Mexico City in 1985 result that collapse of 13 hospitals in, in just three of those buildings. 866 people died hundreds of whom were health personnel. Nearly 6,000 hospital beds were lost in the metropolitan facilities. As a result of the hurricane Mitch in 1998, the water supply system of 23 hospitals in Honduras were damaged or destroyed, and 123 health centers were affected. Peru reported that nearly 10% of the country's health facilities suffered damage as a result of El Nino events in 1997 to 1998. Key facts. Number one, climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health cleaner, safe drinking water, sufficient food and secure shelter. Number two, between 2030 and 2050, Climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and, yet, and heat stress. Number three, the direct damage caused to health, excluding costs in health determining sectors such as agriculture and water and sanitation, is estimated to be two and four billion US dollar year by 2030. Number four, areas with weak health infrastructure, mostly in developing countries, will be the least able to cope with our assistance to prepare and respond. Number four, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases through better transport, food and energy use choices can result in improved health, particularly to reduce air pollution. Climate change. Over the last 50 years, human activities, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, have released sufficient quantities of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to trap additional heat in the lower atmosphere and affect the global climate. In the last 130 years, the world has warmed by approximately 0.8 85 Celsius each of the last three decades has been successively warmer than any preceding decade since 1850. Sea levels are rising, glaciers are melting, and precipitation patterns are changing. Extreme weather events are becoming more intense and frequent. What is the impact of climate change on health? Although global roaming may bring some localized benefits, such as fewer winter death in temporary climates and increased food production in certain areas, the overall health effect of a changing climate are overwhelmingly negative. Climate change affects many of the social and environmental determinants of health. Clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food and secure shelter. Extreme heat. Extreme high air temperatures contributes directly to death from cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Particularly among the elderly people. In the heat wave of summer 2003 in New York, for example, more than 70,000 excess deaths were recorded. High temperature also raised the levels of ozone 
and other pollutants in the air that exacerbate cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Pollen and other ioallergen levels are also higher in extreme heat. This can be triggered asthma, which affects around 300 million people. Patterns of infection. Climatic conditions strongly affect waterborne diseases and diseases transmitted to insects, snails, or other cold blood animals. Changes in climate are likely to lengthen the transmission seasons of important sector diseases and to alter the geography range, for example. Climate changes project with widening significance in the area of China where the snowbird disease cystosomiasis occurs. Malaria is strongly influenced by climate transmitted by Anopheles mosquito. Malaria kills over 400,000 people every year, mainly children under five years old in certain African countries. The Hades mosquito vector of dengue is also highly sensitive to climate conditions. And studies suggest that climate change is likely con to consume to increase exposure to dengue. Measuring the health effect from climate change can only be very approximate. Nevertheless, a World Health Organization assessment, taking into account on a subset of possible health impact and ushering continuing economic growth and health progress, conclude that climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year between 2030 and 2050. 38,000 due to heat exposure in elderly people, 48,000 due to diarrhea, 60,000 due to malaria, and 95,000 due to childhood undernutrition. Who is at risk? All populations will be affected by climate change, but some are more vulnerable than others. People living in small island developing states and other coastal regions, mega cities, and mountains and polar regions are particularly vulnerable. Children, in particular, children living in poor countries are among the most vulnerable to the resulting health risk and will be exposed longer to the health consequences. The health effects are also expected to be more severe from elderly people and people with infirmative or pre-existing medical condition. Era with weak health infrastructure, mostly in developing countries, will be the least able to cope without assistance to prepare and respond. Changing land use and land cover. Human activity is rapidly transforming our planet. The most pervasive changes to the landscape include deforestation, extension and intensification of agriculture, and livestock management. The construction of dams, irrigation projects, and roads, and rapidly spreading urbanizations, in addition to the well known environmental cost and the changes, each also has important health implications that are often less recognized. However, growing number of studies that combine ecology and human health are demonstrating how these activities impact the emergence of new infectious diseases and alter the distribution of already recognized diseases. Consider one of the main causes of global environmental change. Land use is generally defined as human modification and land in the ways it is used, clearing forests for agriculture, infrastructure development, timber harvesting, among others. Changes in land use have multiple drivers, ranging from population growth, migration, and changes in governmental policies, to cultural changes influencing attitude towards land, dietary transition, and incentive for forest conservation. Usually, the goal of LUC is to obtain natural resources 
to fulfill human needs, which can result in negative impacts on the environment and human health. There is evidence that LUC has affected global water and carbon cycles and global climate worldwide. Agricultural expansion, a component of LUC, remains the most substantial driver of deforestation rate. About 40% of deforestation in the tropics and subtropics is for large-scale commercial agriculture. From 2010 to 2015, loss of forest area occurred mainly in the tropics, reaching 1,770 million hectares in 2015. During the same time period, Brazil ranked first in net tropical forest loss, accounting for 984,000 hectares of net forest loss per year. Deforestation in the Amazon, while not as prevalent as it used to be, increased by 20% between 2015 and 2016. 7,889 square kilometers of Brazil jungles were lost from August 2015, July 2016. And between 2001 and 2015, 1 million 809, 553,000 hectares of forest have been lost in Peru. Changes in ecosystems can have harmful consequences to human health. It is estimated that almost one quarter of the global burn of disease can be attributed to the environmental changes, including LUC that contribute to earth, water, and soil pollution, fresh fragmentation, and degradation due to LUC is threatening the Amazon Beijing, one of the most biodiverse regions on earth and provider of key environmental services that contribute to global and local well-being. These impacts in turn affect human health through different pathways. For intense by changing vector population dynamics and pathogen transmission dynamics, potentially contributing to increased disease burden related to vector-borne diseases. Global pollution. Pollution is a massive overlooked cause of disease, death and environmental degradation. Pollution was responsible in 2015 for 9 million premature death, three times as many deaths as caused by AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. 92% of PRD pollution related death occurs in low and middle income countries. And in the hardest hit countries, PRD is responsible for more than one death in four. Household air and water pollution. The traditional forms of pollution are decreasing and death from pneumonia and diarrhea are down. But ambient air, chemical and soil pollution are all on the rise and non-communicable diseases caused by these forms of pollution are increasing. Pollution and climate change are closely linked. Both arise from the same sources and both can be controlled by similar solutions. PRD causes great economic losses. These include productivity losses that can reduce gross domestic product by up to 2% Per year, as well as healthcare costs that account for 1.7% 1, 1. of healthcare spending in high income countries and up to 7% in welfare losses due to pollution are estimated to amount to 4.6 trillion per year, 6.2% of global economic output. Pollution and PRD are not the unavoidable consequences of economic development. The notion that LMICS must pass through a phase of pollution and disease as they grow is obsolete data and not well substantiated. 
proven cost-effective pollution control strategies are available today to countries at every income level. These solutions are based on law, policy, and technology, and the most effective way to eliminate pollution at its source. Pollution control and PRD prevention will require that effective countries, international agencies, mayor foundation, research institutions, and civil society make pollution prevention at high priority to set firm targets for PRD reduction, to establish data systems for monitoring pollution and PRD, and to end the externalization of pollution by enforcing the polluter pays principle. The donor community can provide much needed technical and financial support. Pollution is one of the great existential challenges of the 21st century. It threatens that stability of the earth ecosystems, undermines the economic and social development and nations, and endangers the health of billions Pollution, especially pollution of earth, water and soil caused by industrial emissions, motor vehicle exhaust, and toxic chemicals has risen sharply in the past century. And in the absence of aggressive intervention, ambient air pollution is on track to increase an additional 50% by 2050. The greatest increases will be seen in the growing cities of rapidly industrialization, low and middle income countries. How is this impacting our health? Non communicable disease, warmer temperature associated with climate change, increase the formation of tropospheric ozone, a main constituent of smoke and contributor to cardiorespiratory diseases and or associated with longer pollen seasons or increased pollen production, intensifying alleged respiratory disease, such as asthma. Particulate air pollution is driving increases in cardiovascular diseases or associated mortality. We are also currently experiencing a global epidemic in overnutrition characterized by excessive intake of the wrong foods largely driven by inadequate access to fruit, vegetables, fish, and nuts and seeds, resulting in unprecedented rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Infectious disease. Infectious disease like malaria, cystosomiasis, dengue fever, and Zika virus are responsible for large burden of disease globally and are highly sensitive to change in environmental conditions, including temperature, soil moisture, and precipitation patterns, deforestation, dams and irrigation projects, and others. It's an urgent priority to better understand how land management practices alter the risk of these diseases in different settings, and what type of interventions can reduce exposure to these diseases. Most emerging diseases globally are zoonotic diseases, with both human and animal sources. A clearer understanding of anthropogenic influences on the emergence of zoonotic diseases like HIV and Ebola is another priority on planetary health research. Given the implications for food security and life livelihood, as well as for the state of global biodiversity, animals, disease is also an important subterm of disease, ecology, and planetary health research context. Mental health. A growing evidence base explored to mental health the, the missions of global environmental change. What are the mental health causes of environmental degradations? Are they significant mental health benefits or are managing natural system at particular rate. Other the mental health burden associated with the medical exposure, the nature of healer distributes across different populations. 
better understanding of these issues could meaningfully inform resource management decisions and urban design to mitigate the mental health impact of environmental change. Nutrition. Most of the global burden of disease is related to inadequate intake of calories, micronutrients, or certain food groups like fruit, vegetables, meats, nuts, and seeds. Additional burden of disease is associated with excessive intake of wrong food, global food demand, has never before increased more rapidly and the biophysical conditions that underpin our global food production system have never been changing so rapidly. As a result, humanity is enormously vulnerable to health impact from environmental change mediated through changing access to nutrition. Civil strife and displacement. We poorly understand the ways in which multiple complex, coincident, and interacting environmental changes will alter availability and drive population displacement. But these changes are likely to be associated with large burden of diseases and disability. Little is currently understood about how the combination of climate disruption, natural hazard, droughts, heat waves, floods, fires, tropical storms, water scarcity, land degradation, and resulting crop lists of failures may interact to make parts of the world that currently support large numbers of people uninhabitable. How many people are likely to be displaced? What population are most vulnerable? And when people are displaced, many of them with very few resources, into areas where they may not be welcome. Will civil strife ensure? We know that such displacement is associated with sharp increases in infectious disease outbreaks, malnutrition, and physical mental trauma. What are the best approaches to managing increasing requirements for population movement with the least conflict and health burden? These types of questions require urgent focus 